thanks to everyone I met uh, with today. Uh, super stimulating uh, conversations. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about microbial ecology, but because of the background that uh, Tom mentioned, uh, it has some physics flavor to it, so don't be too scared. Uh, so what we do in my lab, we use, uh, we isolate bacteria from soil. So we prepare pure culture, uh, we grow pure cultures of different strains that we find in soil. Then we measure different, uh, oops, still figuring how this works, uh, uh, measuring different uh, types of uh, interaction networks uh, between them. And then using the same panel of species, uh, we can also uh, measure how species go up and down in different uh, communities that you can form from uh, within this panel of uh, species. And uh, this connection, this ecological connection, how the interactions uh, affect the, uh, the dynamics, is pretty complicated uh, linear layer. that even if we were to completely master this uh, connection here, that won't give us predict predictability for very long, and that's because of uh, evolution. Evolution is uh, very fast uh, 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 with microbes or mutations that can change uh, this ecological, uh, ecological interaction, in, in interacting networks happen uh, very fast, and they happen pretty much on the same time scale as the ecological dynamics, and uh, that's why we're interested in something called ecoevolution, where you have some complicated ecological dynamics, but at the same time, the internal strains appear uh, uh, that, that, that add nodes to the interaction networks with uh, uh, different properties. Well, I mean, uh, uh, one, uh, a microbe will mutate with probability, let's say, one in a hundred or one in a thousand per genome. There will be uh, somewhere a mutation. But if you have a large population of, say, 10 to the 12 bacteria, you can be sure to hit every possible single nucleotide mutation within every generation, well, pretty much so. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of mutation uh, happening. Um, right. So uh, as uh, some of you uh, might know, most uh, microbial communities are extremely diverse. If you take a single teaspoon of soil, you might find 10,000 different species there, not 10,000 individuals. There will be billions upon of billions of bacteria, but there will be 10,000 of different bacteria uh, with some complicated uh, interactions uh, between them. Okay, and uh, uh, this diversity is a bit puzzling uh, from an evolutionary perspective because uh, uh, if uh, uh, if these bacteria compete with each other, we might expect that uh, there will be a, a single best bacteria in that habitat which will outcompete all these other bacteria. That's called the competitive exclusion principle, and it's also known as survival of the fittest. And because of that, micro, uh, uh, ecologists for a long time have struggled to explain uh, uh, generation and maintenance of uh, extremely diverse communities. Okay? Now, there are at least two types of uh, uh, or at least two classes of explanations for this uh, diversity. One class is that microbial communities are diverse because uh, uh, the abiotic environment in which they are is, is very complex. Okay, so you, you have all kinds of uh, uh, environments such as soil or heterogeneous down to very small uh, scales. So if, in fact, you have many different micro niches and you have many different species which are adapted to this, uh, to, to this uh, uh, very many niches. So the complexity is kind of exogenous to the community. The environment is complex, that's why the community is complex. And within that category, you might say that's the reason, to give you a familiar example, the polar bear and the grizzly bear coexist because there is some environmental gradient uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the two bears are adapted to different conditions. Now, the other explanation is that even if the environment is, is simple, diversity is somehow generated and maintained through some complex network of uh, interaction. Okay, so uh, the diversity emerges uh, through the interactions. So it's not imposed uh, uh, externally. So we call that uh, emergent diversity. And 
for the purposes of uh, this talk, we'll just focus on this uh, second explanation, not necessarily because it's more important, but because we kind of better understand uh, this uh, first explanation and we're, and uh, the second explanation is some, somehow more mysterious. And uh, uh, what we'll try to do is give specific mechanisms through which diverse communities can maintain themselves uh, uh, through uh, interactions. Okay, so given that we want to focus on uh, this explanation and we want to eliminate this one, uh, we can think of what happens in one niche environment. And uh, for our purposes, you can think of, let's say there is a single food source, there are no environmental gradients. Uh, and kind of the generic expectation would be that a single strain will uh, win a single genotype uh, over a long time, will uh, win the competition in that niche. But it's also possible that, there, uh, that this uh, situation is evolutionarily unstable and we'll get uh, what's called adaptive diversification event and uh, many different strains will evolve that will coexist in that environment. Okay, so we'll call that emergent uh, ecology. And now we can ask questions on uh, two separate levels. Uh, we can look at this emergent uh, ecology and study the interaction network, the statistical properties of the interaction networks. And then we can try to see, do these statistical properties actually explain the coexistence uh, uh, that we see uh, ecologically? And then uh, uh, we can talk about the actual evolutionary process uh, that takes place and ask questions uh, about uh, what the diversification mechanism is, and perhaps are there different ways in which we can get these uh, different emergent uh, ecologies? So can you classify the evolution and dynamics in uh, different categories? Okay, so uh, first of all, why uh, uh, can you even get uh, an emergent e ecology? Or why is it possible for many strains to coexist in a simple environment? Well, the answer is that microbes don't just occupy uh, God-given uh, niches. Microbes also actually remodel their environment by consuming molecules from the environment and secreting molecules into the environment. Okay, and in this way they change the selection pressures on other organisms. So all organisms do these things because to the very minimum they need to eat and secrete waste products. And the waste products already give us one way for coexistence because these waste products can then feed another bacteria through a process cross called cross-feeding and you can have a community of bacteria maintained through cross-feeding interactions. But uh, kind of uh, amazingly, many bacteria go well, well beyond this kind of uh, minimal niche construction that they need to do and heavily invest resources in secreting uh, weird bioactive uh, uh, molecules such as antibiotics, iron sequestration molecules, quorum sensing molecules, germination signals that uh, I mentioned. Uh, now, yeah, uh, when microbiologists study these interactions, in many cases we know a lot about what these interactions are. Maybe we know the chemical structure of the molecule and how it acts. But, we're, uh, but almost no one knows what happens uh, or, or what are the ecological and evolutionary con consequences of such activities if we, uh, for the system if we propagate it uh, for a long time. So this is what we are going to focus uh, on. Uh, so, uh, Many bacteria encode the capacity, and many soil bacteria in particular, encode the capacity to, to secrete many, many different uh, small molecules. So here you see a bunch of different uh, species of, uh, or uh, genesis of uh, bacteria. And uh, you see sometimes bacteria can make up to, uh, from 20 all the way to, to 70 different antibiotic-like molecules. So that's individual strain can make 70 types of antibiotics or iron sequestration molecules, uh, things like that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, many uh, soil bacteria are also naturally multi-drug resistant. You can isolate uh, bacteria from some cave that's been sealed for 100,000 years, never seen uh, human-made antibiotics, and in there you isolate bacteria that are naturally multi-drug resistant to 15, in this uh, case out of 20 most commonly used clinical antibiotics. And that's because bacteria have lived in soil for a very long time uh, and did warfare with producing antibiotics and being resistant to different antibiotics. So you, you have a situation where different strains produce different antibiotics and the, or, or, or every strain produces many antibiotics and also every strain is resistant to many antibiotics. And the result of all that is this complex uh, network of uh, strong uh, interactions, dense network of strong interactions. So at some point uh, uh, during my uh, 
postdoc, what I did is I isolated bacteria from small grains of soil and just uh, uh, determined uh, how compounds from one bacteria affected the growth of another. And all I want to point out here is that this uh, saturated red here uh, demonstrates is, 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 uh, is, 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 uh, is almost 30%. So with 30% probability, if I grab two random isolates from soil, one of them will be able to kill uh, the other. Uh, so this, uh, this is a strong network of interactions. And also, if you look at compare columns, uh, rows and columns of this matrix, you see that pretty much every strain that you can pull out of soil is different in a way in the way it inter interacts. Pretty much no one uh, uh, is the same. So we started uh, wondering. So this kind of led us to this question that uh, we thought uh, about for a very long time. Given that we have this diversity of uh, bacteria with different antibiotic production and resistance uh, capabilities, and given these dense interaction networks. Is it possible that the interactions uh, kind of uh, can maintain that diversity? And uh, it's a non-trivial question. In fact, it's unclear whether uh, uh, warfare uh, inhibitory interactions uh, uh, will lead to long-term coexistence of, of many different species. And it was only around 1997 that the mechanism by which that can happen was proposed. Uh, the idea basically is that uh, maybe you can have uh, uh, rock, paper, scissor games forming. For example, imagine this bacteria is making an antibiotic, and then there is a version of that bacteria that doesn't make the antibiotic, and then uh, another that is resistant to the antibiotic but doesn't produce it. Now, these three bacteria exhibit what's called cyclic dominance. So this guy will kill this because of the antibiotic. The producer will kill the sensitive. The sensitive will outcompete the resistant because of the cost of resistance. And the resistant will outcompete the producer because of cost of production. And importantly, this mechanism only works in spatial setting if you very carefully preserve the, uh, the spatial structure. So this is a simulation. You see these uh, beautiful uh, spiral uh, waves, and three, three different strains are coexisting uh, through this mechanism. Uh, what happens, uh, however, is that uh, this diversity is very fragile. As soon as we introduce some um, diffusion of the microbes or uh, uh, dispersal, uh, we kind of go from coexistence to uh, Again, survival of the fittest or a single, uh, uh, a single winner. And th uh, this uh, uh, antibiotic producing, uh, uh, and th this kind of limits uh, the explanatory power of this mechanism for environments such as soil. For example, every time it rains, the spores of this antibiotic producing bacteria will be scrambled around. You will destroy the spatial structure, so uh, uh, you won't be able to explain diversity man maintenance through, through this mechanism. And this kind of led us to this uh, more pointed question. Can we explain diversity even if you don't preserve spatial structure at all times? Even if you allow uh, for uh, maybe spatial structure is important, but every now and then the environment gets uh, mixed up. Okay? So we didn't know how to uh, uh, answer that. So we started doing some uh, experiments looking for inspiration. So I will explain you uh, two different uh, ways of measuring uh, 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 for quantifying uh, relationships between the bacteria and how we derive some theory from there that, uh, that could uh, answer this uh, question that I posed. So the first, uh, in the first experiment, we took uh, this uh, uh, soil bacteria and uh, just competed them in pairs. Uh, we just uh, did a tournament uh, where we competed every pair against uh, every other. And then we asked this simple question, is it possible to order these bacteria in terms of their competitive uh, ability? Is there uh, is it the case that one uh, bacteria is the best, and then uh, there is a second best and third best, uh, and so on? So this is what you, you would expect based on the competitive exclusion uh, principle. Or maybe you see a lot of rock, paper, scissor games. Uh, or maybe the whole thing is completely non-hierarchical, and the notion of hierarchy doesn't uh, even make uh, sense. And uh, in the second uh, type of experiment, we asked with relation to, uh, to antibiotic interactions whether, let's say, antibiotic-sensitive bacteria uh, is better off or uh, worse off if we add a third bacteria around, okay? So are non-pairwise uh, interactions uh, important for the ecosystem? So uh, here is the, uh, the first uh, uh, experiment. Uh, so we take uh, a strain at low abundance, 0.1%, and then we mix it with a lot of the other strain, 99.9% of the other strain, 
we put them in a tube uh, covered uh, in gel, uh, nutrient gel. We grow them. They sporulate. After that, we collect all the spores, freeze them. So we can sequence later the DNA to determine what's happening in the community. And then we can put a fraction of the spores back uh, uh, in, in a new tube and keep uh, propagating for, for, for several cycles. And basically, uh, we are asking whether the, the low abundance uh, strain is uh, 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 can increase in abundance. And if it can, then we say that, the, in this case, the purple strain can invade uh, the green strain. Okay, And then we'll draw an arrow from the purple strain to the green strain. And by the way, this is the work of uh, my graduate student, Eric Wright, who, who is now at the University of Pittsburgh. So he managed to find the faculty position even without uh, a postdoc. And I'll try to summarize his basically job talk like in three minutes here and uh, then tell you some other things. So if you uh, look at uh, these uh, pairwise interactions, there, there are uh, three possibilities. Kind of the one you expect is uh, survival of the fittest. Basically, no matter how you mix the bacteria, one of them is better in that environment than the other. We will outcompete and win. We can also get uh, mutual invasion. Each one can invade at low abundance. That will lead to coexistence. And uh, we can also have a, a case where uh, the more abundant strain in the community outcompetes. So the winner is always the, the, the more abundant strain. Okay. And uh, here is uh, the data. So these are like 18 strains isolated from the same uh, grain of soil and then competed in that uh, fashion. So this is like some 600 and something uh, uh, experiments. Uh, so what I want to point out, what really surprised us uh, immediately, that we saw a lot of bistability. In many cases, what determined who the winner of the competition is, it's not the genome, but it, it's simply uh, who, who is more abundant than the community. So all this means is like the abundant strain wins. And we call that survival of the common. Okay? And that was kind of uh, striking. Uh, it means that uh, kind of strains uh, in the environment have kind of inbuilt home field advantage. Right? If, you, if you're already in the environment, you can push out uh, uh, other strains. And by the way, we didn't find any rock, paper, scissor games. Uh, we found even less that you would expect by chance. So kind of further arguing that this mechanism about the rock, paper, scissor games is not uh, really the right mechanism for explaining diversity. Now, you can still undergo, uh, uh, you can still do this exercise of trying to assign competitive abilities to, to the bacteria. And this is the best uh, we could do. And as you can see, the network is partially hierarchical, but kind of the striking feature is that instead of a single winner that's, uh, that's best at uh, everything, we have these six mutually exclusive winners. So there are six strains that, uh, that, uh, that, can, uh, that, uh, that can win competi competitions, when, uh, that can win against everyone when they are at, at high abundance. Okay? So it was kind of uh, uh, this massive uh, 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 biostability that we saw in these communities. So again, bacteria that are already settled in an environment have a home field uh, advantage. And we generalize this to multi-species communities. This basically shows that if you start mixing more than two species, you can get generic uh, multi-stability. So here this shows that we mix three strains in equal abundances. And in one replica, we have one result. In the other uh, uh, replica, uh, we have a completely different uh, uh, outcome after propagating uh, for many cycles. So with this bacteria, with this experiments we did in the lab, uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, multi-stability is, is generic in these communities, which was, uh, uh, which is, uh, which was a bit uh, unexpected. Now, uh, the second uh, experiment uh, uh, we did uh, is uh, to ask uh, whether an antibiotic-sensitive strain that's inhibiting, uh, inhibited by antibiotic producer, uh, whether this inhibition is intensified or attenuated if we put a third bacteria around. And as you see from this graph, where all the points are below the diagonal, pretty much we saw that every time we put uh, a third strain, uh, it always reduces the strength of inhibition. Okay? Uh, and it turned out that uh, the, way it, uh, uh, the reason that happens is that uh, many bacteria degrade antibiotics. Okay? So soil bacteria uh, produce many antibiotics, but they also are very good at degrading antibiotics. And this uh, uh, antibiotic degradation mediates this non-pairwise, this higher order interactions. So basically, uh, the sensitive bacteria 
can survive antibiotics if it's near uh, a degrader bacteria. And this is what's shown here in this experimental image. So we have uh, uh, a producer growing on a uh, petri dish uh, full of uh, gel, and then it secretes an antibiotic in the environment. Then we overlay it with the sensitive bacteria, the green stuff, it's fluorescent uh, in this case. And then we see zone of inhibition. Basically, the sensitive bacteria cannot grow near the producer because of the antibiotic. But if we, go, if we uh, put a third bacteria here, a degrader bacteria, now this bacteria that's sensitive to the antibiotic can grow very, very close to the antibiotic producer. So this is kind of an example of how we get uh, this data. Okay? In, any, in any case, uh, we concluded that antibiotic degradation is, uh, is very frequent uh, higher order interaction in our system. And then we said, OK, what's the consequence of that? Let's put that uh, in a model and see what's, uh, what's going to happen. And the model is uh, simple. Uh, we have a bunch of bacteria with different properties. Antibiotic producers produce their antibiotics. Antibiotic degrading bacteria degrade uh, uh, their antibiotics in a, cer in a certain neighborhood. If you're a sensitive bacteria covered in antibiotics, you die. And then at the end, you kind of collect all the survivors, mix them, and start a new cycle. Uh, and uh, then see what happens. So uh, we chose to mix them uh, because remember the big limi limitations of the previous theory was that uh, destruction of spatial structure kills the diversity uh, uh, maintenance. Okay, so we wanted to see if even if you periodically destroy spatial structure, we can get uh, diversity or not. And to cut a long story short, the answer is that uh, with uh, antibiotic degradation, w with the higher order interactions that uh, uh, result from antibiotic degradation, it's very easy to construct uh, uh, stable uh, communities. There are many different ways to do that. But uh, just with pairwise interaction, just with uh, inhibitory, uh, uh, regular pairwise inhibitory interactions, it's never possible. It's like a mathematical theorem. It's no matter how, you, how many species you have and how you arrange the interaction networks and how you much you adjust to the growth rates of this uh, microbes, you never see a stable coexistence. But then you add these higher order interactions and suddenly you add antibiotic degradation. And suddenly it's very easy to, to have diverse communities uh, maintained through interplay between inhibition and degradation. Uh, OK, so, so that's kind of uh, 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 the big uh, message here. And, and, and did this uh, uh, coexistence, uh, coexistence can be very, uh, very robust. Let's say what this shows here is that if one bacteria grows 10 times faster than another uh, one, you can still get coexistence between these uh, three species uh, in this example. Uh, so uh, we showed that we can construct stable communities in which different strains can differ only in terms of their antibiotic production and resistant capabilities, even if they eat the same uh, food, OK? And there are no environmental heterogeneities and so on. So uh, and by the way, the minimal motif, the, uh, the simplest way to get coexistence was through this motif that maintained three species on two antibiotics, okay? So we were super uh, excited uh, uh, for from, uh, by, by this result. So that was kind of the first explanation showing how antibiotic interactions can uh, uh, lead to diversity and maintain very diverse communities. Um, uh, and uh, kind of the message here is that very often in ecology, we work with these uh, networks of pairwise interactions. And what we showed uh, that in this case, pairwise interaction networks are fundamentally insufficient to explain diversity. And, uh, and uh, non-pairwise interactions can be essential for community stabilities. And then after our paper came out, there were like another two or three papers just exploring this in more and more detail. So I think it's becoming increasingly clear that kind of this paradox of diversity more or less disappears once we go away from pairwise interactions and start including uh, this more, uh, 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 if you start considering uh, more complicated types of interactions. So, uh, so what I showed you is that if you if, if uh, you can construct uh, communities by uh, uh, adjusting growth rates and interaction networks, you can at least in silico form stable communities. But what we really want to know if this is a viable mechanism for explaining diversity is whether these communities can spontaneously emerge through uh, some kind of a natural uh, uh, through, through evolution, OK? And uh, kind of the other thing we wanted to see is if we go beyond this super minimalistic model that I showed you that uh, uh, 
well, whether if we add more realistic details, this interplay between uh, antibiotic production and degradation is still going to work as a diversity uh, ma uh, maintaining mechanism. So uh, one, one detail that we added is the life cycle of uh, antibiotic uh, producing bacteria that we use in the, in the lab. So what's going on here is we have spores, they, uh, they germinate, they grow as branching mycelium uh, networks, and uh, after a while they sporulate. But before they sporulate, they flood the area with antibiotics, okay? And uh, uh, the reason they do it is, is, is because uh, this mycelial mass, this biomass here, uh, starts to commit suicide to feed the for formation of spores. And uh, once there are all these nutrients released, uh, they need to be protected by uh, antibiotics. So that's kind of the thinking of how uh, antibiotics are uh, used uh, uh, in the environment kind of as a defense mechanism. So we put that, uh, that uh, in the, the model. Uh, now it's, everything is much more realistic. We have uh, different spores. They germinate, form these colonies. They eat all the available food. Then ant uh, producers produce antibiotics, degraders degrade antibiotics. You have this uh, uh, kind of continuum of different microenvironments there. Some, some bacteria die. And then kind of... Uh, 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 it's worth noticing that the, the, the guys that are near, uh, so if your neighbors are inhibited, you're doing better in terms of sporulation. Uh, and that's because uh, uh, the neighbor doesn't steal the resources, uh, resources from you, and you can steal some uh, resources from your dead neighbor. So this is where the advantage of inhibition comes, uh, comes from. So we put all that uh, uh, in a model. Uh, and. Uh, Importantly, so that, that, that was the ecological part. We also had uh, evolution. And the way we had uh, evolution is that uh, 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 we allow basically uh, the bacteria to freely evolve their investment in antibiotic uh, degradation and antibiotic uh, production. The, uh, and uh, uh, so mutations can, can move them around. So, so this guy, for example, decreases its antibiotic uh, degradation or it can suddenly acquire an ability to produce an antibiotic. Uh, uh, and then we, we simply asked if we start with a single strain in an environment and add these mutations and then follow these uh, ecological dynamics uh, and simulate uh, these things over uh, tens of thousands of uh, generations, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, and are we going to get uh, 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 diversity? So this is the one antibiotic case. So, uh, so what's shown here is on the y-axis is the space of possible phenotypes, which in this case is uh, uh, one-dimensional. And then uh, sh shown are uh, the strains that are present in the ecosystem as a function of time. And what you see that after a few hundred uh, cycles, maybe a stable community forms that contains only uh, three strains. And after that, uh, nothing much uh, happens. Now, if you uh, stop the mutations in the si simulations, that community will keep persisting, which means that this is evolutionary stable. Okay, so uh, if you perturb this community, it will uh, persist. Uh, uh, at the same time, it's also evolutionary stable because no mutation now exists anywhere in the space of possibilities that can invade. Okay, so in language of game theory, that's called Nash equilibrium. Okay, so there are several strategies; no other strategy can now uh, 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 now invade. And we can look at this, uh, uh, and overall, this is called evolutionary stable uh, state. And uh, uh, as you c so we can do the phase diagram. Now we can just take the three final states here and uh, mix them in different abundances, see how it looks, and how this diversity is maintained. And actually, it's not a rock, paper, scissor game. In fact, we have uh, 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 kind of this emergent bistability uh, happening here. So it turned out that uh, uh, both uh, things that we observed, like the higher order interactions and this uh, bi-stability that uh, we observed uh, uh, in the real data, they kind of naturally emerge uh, uh, and, uh, and play a role in, uh, in the, um, as uh, 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 they're, they're both key players in uh, creating uh, and maintaining uh, stable communities. Okay, so that's with uh, one antibiotics. Now we can add a second antibiotics. It turned out that with two antibiotics now, you have more complex adaptive diversification where you go from one strain 
to five uh, strains, and it happens very, very um, fast. Uh, but uh, kind of uh, 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 what's interesting is that uh, these communities that we are uh, able to find uh, by evolution to with these more kind of sophisticated models are, in fact, even more diverse than those that uh, uh, we saw initially with this, uh, uh, that we are able to manually construct with, uh, with the minimum model. So adding re uh, evolution and adding realism actually increases the complexity. Like previously, well, the minimum motif was like we need at least two antibiotics for, to maintain three species. Now we can maintain them with one antibiotics. And now with two antibiotics, we can maintain five species rather than just uh, 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 three uh, antibiotics. So adding realism, adding evolution actually uh, 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 leads to more and more diversity. So with this, we kind of answer this initial question uh, that we had. Can antibiotic interactions lead to diverse uh, communities? But uh, something else surprised us uh, when we started doing these simulations. And uh, it is that as we varied parameters, in this case, we just varied the cost of antibiotic resistance, we saw this zoo of different uh, uh, qualitatively different uh, modes in which the dynamics can uh, look at. So what I showed you is just the case where uh, stable diversity emerges. So, so you start with a single strain, and you don't see it here, but then uh, you have uh, five strains uh, coexisting. But then you change the parameters, and you get uh, uh, some, uh, a whole bunch of different regimes. So here is uh, a regime where you have diversity. At every time point, you have a diverse community. But this diverse community is never evolutionally stable. There always exists a mutation that will come, invade, and destroy that community. And it keeps changing and changing. Uh, and uh, 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 so, so we call that rapid turnover, or also red queen, because every strain needs to keep e e uh, evolving in order to persist in that environment. No single, uh, no, no single phenotype uh, survives at all uh, time points. And you see it uh, looks completely uh, chaotic. Now, in between this. Uh, uh, rapid turnover regime and the, the regime where we have diverse evolution stable state, we get this very pronounced intermittency. Right? So, uh, for, uh, so for a while, you have like a five-strain community as before. It looks stable. It persists for thousands of generations. Suddenly, this thing collapses. Then we get chaotic dynamics for a very long time, again, thousands of generations. And then, eventually, it will find uh, a stable community again, and it's going to collapse. So that was kind of uh, unexpected and uh, undescribed in the literature, this type of uh, equilibrium in dynamics. But of course, from a physics perspective, it uh, makes uh, total sense, right? So we know this famous example from turbulence, laminar flow, you open your uh, faucet very little. You have nice laminar flow, you open it a lot, you get turbulent flow. But in between, you see this regime shift from uh, between uh, turbulent flow and laminar flow. And in our case, we have this more ordered state, which is the evolution stable state, which you have five strains just keep coexisting. We have this chaotic state, the rapid turnover state, and we have the intermittency uh, regime. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so basically, uh, I, uh, 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 we, we assume that it's very easy. So, so basically, these mutations here, uh, I'm going the wrong direction. If you go to the place where I explain the mutations, I mean, so what this means, so, uh, jumping from this place to this place, what that means, it might be a simple point mutation where I have the antibiotic uh, production gene, but it's simply shut off. I don't make any of that antibiotic. And then uh, I, a simple point mutation, a little mutation, now um, uh, I start making a lot of antibiotics and that costs me a lot of energy, but maybe it's um, beneficial. So uh, it's, we assume that it's very easy to jump to this space. And there are two ways to jump to it. One is mutations, the other is horizontal gene transfer that uh, it's kind of this very, very uh, fascinating phenomenon where a chunk of DNA from one bacteria can go into another bacteria and actually these antibiotic gene clusters there, there are clusters, there are chunks of DNA that that frequently transfer between the microbes. But in any case, it turns out that at least for low dimensional spaces like one or two antibiotics, it doesn't matter what the mechanism of uh, uh, 
evolution is. Uh, and uh, I, I can model uh, the mutations any way I want, and I still see the same phenomenon. Now, if I go to, let's say, 1,000 antibiotics, then it's a huge space. And if I don't have like uh, astronomically large population size, I'll be at every point just exploring just small parts of this phase space. And then it becomes very important of exactly how evolution works. Does it work through horizontal gene transplant? Does it learn through point mutations? But if you restrict yourself to one or two antibiotics, and let's just imagine everyone has the same capabilities, but it can just tune, tune them up and down through mutations, uh, then uh, uh, that's what we are looking at. So what we mean by evolution is simple mutations that change the resource allocation of bacteria to one capability or the other. Okay? So it's kind of very simple everyday evolution where you become, or I am making twice as, many, uh, as much as antibiotic as before, or I'm three times, I'm making three times more degrading enzymes. And that can easily happen through uh, a small genetic change, or I can, uh, but in reality, you can also grab a cluster from someone else. For, we can grab a gene from another bacteria that can do that. Okay, so great question. So, so this was, uh, uh, in these uh, simulations, you basically scoop all the bacteria together at the end of every cycle. But you can also do them in a completely spatially extended uh, environment where you have many different locations and there's some diffusion of bacteria between locations. And in this context, this intermittency basically manifests as phase coexistence. Basically, imagine soil, maybe in this part of soil, I have a community in the rapid turnover phase. Maybe somewhere here I have these five sp 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 strains that's stay together in a quasi-stable fashion for a long time. So it starts to look like a just generic first order transition, right? Where in the case of liquids, if you start to compress gas at constant uh, pressure, you, you go to liquid, but there is this long regime of, of two-phase coexistence. And I think that's the correct in interpretation of what we are seeing. So we are seeing a first order transition. And for, for us, that's uh, interesting because it, te uh, it tells us that Generically, uh, uh, if we have uh, a diverse Nash equilibrium, when you, if you have many species stably coexisting, if you start tuning parameters to get out of this regime, uh, you're sta uh, starting to uh, uh, seeing this intermittency, which gives us hope that this intermittency is not something that we just saw in our simulations, but perhaps it's generic evolutionary phenomenon. And now that we sequence so many uh, 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 microbial communities over time, we'll start seeing uh, this is something that we can look for, like uh, equivolutionary intermittency. Right? But that's not all. I mean, you discover things that you completely don't uh, anticipate. So here, you have a diverse community, again, persisting for thousands of generations. Uh, and it looks just like the evolutionary stable state. But then you turn off mutation, and it completely collapses. There is a single strain that wins. So this state persists despite a constant bombardment of uh, mutations. But you turn off the mutation, and it collapses. So it's kind of paradoxical, but we traced it, and it turned out that uh, that was due to this loss of function mutation. So if you're a producer, you can stop producing antibiotics, but still be resistant by pumping out the antibiotics. If you're a degrader, you can stop degrading antibiotics, and so on. So if uh, uh, so, uh, you can uh, constantly, the, the persistent strains can constantly create other strains that are present in very, very low abundance and maybe fluctuate in the environment. But these strains that are created uh, through genetic mutations somehow act to stabilize the abundant strains that are always present in the community. Okay, so we call that persistent without ecological stability. That was also something that was not uh, described uh, in the literature. And then we keep looking at the phase diagram and you find other things. So here, for example, there are three strains that exist all the time, but then two other strains keeps fluctuating. So that was kind of uh, 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 interesting. Uh, now, uh, if I have some uh, more time, I'll just uh, focus on uh, one more thing that we did with uh, uh, this system. Now we can focus again on this Nash equilibrium, this diverse Nash equilibrium, and just ask this uh, question. This is with my uh, postdoc, uh, Silfoya Kutil. So given that the system can reach a diverse uh, Nash equilibrium, a diverse evolutionary stable state, what is the mechanism by which uh, that happens? Okay. As you see, it's kind of tricky to figure what's happening because it's happening very fast. Many things are happening simultaneously. And we said, oh, we know what uh, to do. If we decrease the mutation rate, if you m uh, make the mutation rare in the system, then we kind of space out all the changes that need to happen 
to go from one strain uh, to five different strains, and we can more easily reconstruct the, the assembly process. Okay? And in fact, it turns out well, that's what's relevant is not the mutation per individual, but the mutation rate for the entire community. So mu times n, where n is the number of individuals. So you lower uh, uh, this mu times n, in this case, some 16 times. And this is what happened. And you also actually can see that now here the community emer emerges, let's say, in a few hundred generations. Now we, we lower mu n uh, 16 times. Now we emerge uh, 30,000 generations. So it's much, much delayed. We spend a lot more time in this rapid turnover phase, but still, when it forms, it snaps together all at once on a very, very short time scale. So we couldn't resolve anything by lowering down you know, the mutation rate. Okay. So this kind of led to this very simple two-state model where you have uh, two phases and maybe the rapid turnover phase is, is metastable and it wants to transition to the, to the evolution stable phase, but there's some barrier along the way and you need to tunnel through this barrier. And, uh, and this is in, uh, 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 indeed confirmed by looking at the statistics. So if you run many simulations in parallel and ask uh, what's the probability distribution of community formation times, you see this is exponential. So this is exactly like, uh, I don't know, radioactive uh, decay, right? So this entire process, as complicated as it is, can be co co uh, quantified by a single uh, uh, parameter, which is the, the rate r, the probability per unit time that the rapid turnover phase will turn into the evolutionary stable community. And now we can ask, okay, how does this r depend on mu nn? Now, before I uh, uh, answer you this uh, question, let's think, uh, think about what to expect. Now, by far the, the simplest way to think about uh, uh, evolution of a complex system, in this case an ecosystem, is that mutations come one by one and do something to the system. Uh, so in this case, in this example, let's say you have a trivial ecosystem population which, which consists of one strain only, then a mutant uh, it mutates, the mutant happens to be able to coexist with uh, this other strain. So we have two strains coexisting. Now you wait a while, another mutation happens, one strain gets extinct, you, you transition to another uh, community, then another strain appears, you, we transition to another uh, 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 ecological state. But they, uh, again, like uh, 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 in this step-by-step -step, uh, uh, evolutionary picture, which is, by the way, called adaptive dynamics, uh, uh, you, you imagine the dynamics as uh, jumps between different uh, ecological equilibria through, uh, through mutations. And kind of the assumption here is that the, that the mutations are so rare that the ecological dynamics always has time to equilibrate to reach its attractor before uh, uh, mutations, uh, between mutations, okay? And in this limit, it kind of very easily follows. Each of these arrows here jumps from one ecological state to another. Each of these rates will be proportional to uh, 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 to mu times n, and it follows that the rate of discovery of, of, uh, of any state actually is, is just going to be proportional to, to, to mu times n, okay? So that's our expectation, that the rate of discovery will be proportional to mu times n. That's in the limit where it's possible, uh, uh, in which we picture evolution as a step-by-step -step process. But then well, we run out uh, uh, these uh, simulations and what turns out that, so here is uh, mu n, we see in the case for one antibiotic, the rate of community formation scales as mu n square. In the case of two antibiotics, we have this even uh, uh, kind of steeper uh, dependencies of the rate is mu n to approximately uh, four. So uh, what this indicates, uh, what these non-trivial scaling laws indicate, the important point is that communities do not emerge through a step-by-step -step evolutionary process. And again, step-by-step -step evolution is, this is what explicitly or implicitly everyone is thinking about. You have your complex system, mutations come one by one and change that, uh, that system. And kind of the deviations from that is one way to define what eco-evolution is, okay? So I mean, many people talk about eco-evolution, but no, no one defines exactly uh, uh, what it means. So in our, uh, uh, case, uh, the, the kind of the signature of equal evolution is the fact that these uh, this, this exponents are not uh, one. So what's, uh, what's going on here? 
uh, just to give you a mechanistic uh, uh, explanation. So it turns out that you need what we term second order equivolution event. So you have your system in the rapid turnover phase. It jumps from one state to another through mutations. But then the only way to exit uh, this loop, and by the way, it's more complicated. You have a continuum of different strains, but if you simplify it, you can plot it uh, uh, like that. The only way out of this loop is through this orange arrow. And what this or orange arrow means is that as one transition from one state to another is happening, in this case, the gray strain appears and starts to outcompete the blue strain. If you're very lucky, just the right type of mutation happens uh, uh, at exactly the right time, and then uh, 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 three-strain uh, uh, communities uh, uh, snaps, uh, snaps together. And uh, if you model this process, then you can easily uh, get the, the mu n square scaling uh, out of this. And um, if you look at uh, uh, the case of two antibiotics, it looks even crazier. Now, to form a five-strain community, uh, you need to, uh, to first do one tunneling event to a, a three-strain community. Now, this is not evolution. This is ecologically stable community, but not evolutionally stable. Most likely, this is going to collapse through mutation, and then you're going to go back to uh, this chaotic regime here. Uh, but every now and then, once you tunnel here, and then you start, this three-strain community starts collapsing through another mutant invading, you have two additional mutations <laughs> coming <laughs> just with the right properties, just at the right time, and then the five uh, strain community uh, snaps together. So the point is that if I just give you this as a mechanism, you say that's, this is extremely unlikely. That's, that's kind of, okay, that's maybe a theoretical possibility, but this is, requires so many coincidences, that's kind of irrelevant. But you run the simulations, with some reasonable <laughs> mutation uh, rates. And uh, through these uh, complicated mechanisms, you see very, very generically uh, five-strain uh, communities arising. Uh, so uh, kind of to uh, give you the, uh, the bigger uh, uh, picture, so bef uh, before this work, there, there was this theory of adaptive dynamics, which was basically the theory of what happens when mu n uh, goes to zero. Uh, and this is how you, you represent the dynamics as series of jumps between uh, evolutionary, uh, b between ecologically stable states. Now it might happen that if you look at all the possible ecological states of the system and the transitions between them, it might happen that you have some evolutionally stable communities like our five species community that's unreachable starting from, let's say, a single strain uh, community here. So Martin Novak from Harvard uh, uh, calls this Gardens of Eden, okay? It's Garden of Eden because the only way to get this is, uh, this uh, ecosystem is by creation. If God creates all the plants and animals just in the right way and you put it there, it's stable. It's, uh, 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 it, it will persist uh, forever, but evolution uh, cannot go and find it, okay? Now, but that picture is in the limit of mu n uh, going to zero be because the, the existence of that picture implies that uh, uh, the ecological dynamics equilibrates between mutations. What we are saying is that as long as we go uh, by any amount above that uh, limit, if for any finite mu n, it's now it's possible to transition between different, uh, different attractors of the uh, adaptive dynamics. In this case, we have the rapid turnover attractor and we have the garden of Eden attractor. And no matter how small mu n is, sooner or later we're going to jump uh, from one to the other and we're going to discover this much more complicated community that's, uh, that is not possible to get through step-by-step -step evolution. So uh, kind of uh, uh, we see how, even if you cannot imagine how something can happen through step-by-step, uh, uh, -step, it's still possible that the evolution will get you there. So one way to summarize everything is that in the first part of the talk with the ecology, I told you higher order ecological interactions are important for existence of uh, stable communities. But then this latest part is about higher order equivolution events are important for the emergence of stable communities. So we're kind of uh, 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 introducing these uh, 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 new notions. And uh, maybe just in one minute, uh, just to tell how now we can uh, generalize this. If we really take this picture seriously, I can say, oh, I know what this is. This predicts nucleated growth. So if I have a lot of, uh, of an entire, uh, 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 if you have spatially extended system and everyone is in the rapid turnover phase, if I put a large enough cluster 
of uh, uh, an ecologically stable community in there, I would predict that this is going to expand and take, uh, take over. Uh, and when you do simulations, in this case, I'm just showing one dimensional simulation, where you have different communities linked by migration of uh, bacteria. Uh, what's happening is the, if I put the five strains in the middle, the evolution stable community, it's going to rapidly spread and displace uh, whatever other communities are present uh, nearby. So these five strains, they behave as a self-replicating unit. So, uh, so imagine you're in the savanna and somehow, I mean, this has been persisting for a long time, but you come up with five species that interact together in some very special way. You put them in one patch and suddenly that colonizes and takes over the entire savanna. I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of the phenomenon we are uh, talking uh, about here. So, so it's kind of uh, showing that this physics thinking and these two state models and this and that, I mean, they, they kind of uh, 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 now enable you to think about ecosystems and eco-evolution in uh, very different ways. And also it means that even if it's very unlikely to transition to, to discover this five species evolution in stable Nash equilibrium, once you discover it, it's going to conquer the world. It's just going to spread and take over uh, everything. So that's um, the last point I'm going to make. Uh, oh, uh, I guess if we have a minute, I can uh, uh, do a little conclusion here and relate it again to physics since it's a physics seminar. So I've shown you that when you do the simulations at finite mutation rate, we see all these different modes. We see the, uh, that, that I explained. But then it turned out that if you go to the mutation rate going to zero, nothing interesting happens. The only thing that happens is this rapid turnover uh, phase. This kind of uh, uh, similar to, uh, to physics. So uh, in physics, we have this many different uh, states of matter analogous to our different equivo modes. Now, some of these states of matter, such as liquids, like let's say regular liquids, they don't even make sense when we take down the temperature to, to zero, right? There's no such thing as liquid, at, uh, regular liquid uh, at uh, t equals zero. And the point is that in ecology and ecoevolution, pretty much every, all the work, maybe there are some small exceptions, uh, uh, I'm sure there are in the literature, pretty much everyone is implicitly working in this limit but there are all these many different phenomena that are only possible when, you, uh, in, uh, when mutation rate is really not that small. And this is really the regime where uh, ecology and evolution happen on the same time scale uh, and, and, and interplay with each other. And yeah, so uh, basically ecologists often just talk about classical stability, ecological stability, evolution stability, uh, and all that, and I think we should go beyond that and explore uh, the emergent properties uh, more uh, dynamically at finite mutation rates. And one way to think about this is we need kind of to merge Mary condensed matter physics and uh, evolution and developed some classification schemes for uh, systems with evolving interactions. And basically that's kind of the last slide here. Yeah, this is classical condensed matter physics. You have some inter large communities of interacting objects le leading to some emergent properties, what happens if you have large communities of interacting objects but with evolving interactions? Now here, this is more interesting because now we have this top-down causation here. Basically, the, the, the state of the ecosystem determines the selection pressures on the individuals and it directs the evolution of the interactions. So this is something that we mostly don't have in physics. Right? Electrons and electron, electron interaction, they stay the same here, they keep changing. But kind of this work that I showed you kind of made me uh, hopeful, or at least led to this idea that what we really need in microbial ecology is to classify emergent properties. Well, like, uh, right now there's this craze about microbiomes, and a lot of money are also invested in predictive uh, theories of uh, dynamics and uh, so on. But we know from physics that we, once you have complex interactions, it's very hard to predict things. But what we can actually do, and it's still very useful, is to first of all figure what are the different qualitatively different uh, uh, states of matter and maybe start measuring different things in different, uh, depending on the state of matter, right? In, in microbiology, you always do the same thing. You measure the 6 and S uh, uh, RNA and uh, so on. Like in physics, if you have a solid, you might measure elasticity, but you won't measure, <laughs> but you won't measure the viscosity and so on. So I think we need to start switching to uh, 
I, I think yeah, that, that, that will be useful to, to have in microbiology and uh, ecoevolution in general. So that's kind of one way to frame what ecoevolutionary synthesis uh, might mean. Okay, so uh, I'll finish by just, oh, uh, so we are doing experiments. I don't have time to tell you who, uh, 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 I did these experiments testing uh, ecoevolution, you know, basically, and we have some data already, but I'll skip that and uh, just uh, tell you, it's th most of this is funded by Simon's Foundation and NSF, and uh, yeah, this first part, uh, the ecology part was in collaboration with Eric Kelsik and Roy Kishoni, and then, uh, uh, yeah, Eric Wright uh, did the biostability, so Fleck will be the last part of the ratio. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, I would say no. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, no, it makes sense, actually, because you can take the population size to infinity. And actually, I didn't show you, but uh, if, if you go to, the, uh, to one of these papers, uh, it's, it's possible to actually, s for, for, uh, for some systems, it's only at the intermediate uh, uh, population sizes that you can turn on to a community. So imagine you have an ecological system. If it's too small, you cannot form a complex ecosystem. If it's too large, you cannot form it. But it's, there is kind of resonance. If you're just the right size, suddenly it's very, very easy to find it. So once you start experimenting with other models, you start discovering other types of uh, behaviors. And we did this kind of classification of different possible tunneling transitions and stuff like that. But kind of this is the main message. Like in, micro, in microbiology or even in ecology and evolution, like people don't know this stuff from condensed matter physics about classifying phases and phase transitions and this and that. And I mean, for me, once I see it, it's almost trivial, but it's kind of transferring knowledge from one domain to, to the other, and uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. Yeah. Uh, can you explain the difference between dimensions and two dimensions? Uh, we cannot, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you need to, uh, yeah, that's a great uh, question. Well, the, the reason we state with two dimensions is that the, these are, for first of all, we model diffusion of molecules and stuff like that. So even the ecological cycle takes some time to compute. In our case, it takes, let's say, a second or two <laughs> on a CPU to compute. But then we are interested in evolution over, let's say, 100,000 cycles, which means several days. And uh, so with three dimensions, the ecology, I mean, basically what I press the students to do is I want the ecological cycle to be down to one second, simplify the system. <laughs> and that, that's... Uh, I mean, once maybe with GPUs and something like that, if, uh, if you can have clusters of GPUs, you can experiment with three dimensions. And that's kind of one of the directions we're taking. No, not going to three dimensions, but just doing the same, the same type of equilibrium simulations, but in many, many different contexts. Let's say I showed you antibiotics, but it doesn't have to anti be an antibiotics. I can uh, replace the antibiotics with iron sequestration molecules. Now, the dynamics, the game will be slightly different, Maybe I'll see the same, some of the same phases, and then, uh, 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 and uh, which will be good because in condensed matter physics we always see, see solid, liquid gas. We see it's very easy to rediscover that, but maybe there will be also some exotic phases. So if you imagine, uh, I mean, it's kind of uh, you, if you imagine uh, doing these equilibrium uh, simulations in many, many different contexts, you kind of create this map of uh, different uh, possibilities. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping one of you guys <laughs> that haven't lost. I mean, I'm I've been a biologist for too long to think uh, uh, about that. But uh, ah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, hopefully, I mean, yeah, s s some people will take these ideas and take them in different directions. But I haven't thought about that. It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, I'm moving, uh, so, so I'm saying higher order interaction just because there is this, most of eco a lot of ecological theories based on pairwise interactions and there are these puzzles eco ecologically of, that, are, that I think result from thinking only in terms of pairwise interactions. 
I don't think uh, higher order interactions is a good way to go. I think a better way for me is to go, on because I mean, e e I mean, pairwise interaction network is still manageable. I can measure, take all these bugs and do 10 by 10 combinations. If you go to higher order interaction, do I do the cubes of matrices? And then why higher? I mean, ultimately, this is all pairwise interactions, but it's a pairwise, inter it's only becomes higher order interaction if you integrate out all the molecules and stuff like that, if you insist on only paying attention uh, 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 on the species. I think a much more fruitful approach is to learn something specific about uh, 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 h how a particular mechanism works. Let's say uh, 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 you learn about uh, the metabolism inside the cell and you know what the metabolic uh, uh, network is. You have some constraints, you put them in and then you use multi-scale models because it's not only about higher order interactions, it's about this, this bistability, for example, is a non-trivial frequency dependent, it's a cooperativity. So once you start playing with arbitrary functional forms, I mean, how do we even explore this space? Uh, possibly, I mean, people do that. I mean, that, that's uh, kind of, most people, when I say that there are several papers exploring higher order interactions, they'll say, okay, here's a random matrix, uh, matrix, I mean, you, you do, let's say, perform simulations with, random matrices and cubes of coefficients and then oh if you add the cubic terms suddenly it's much higher probability to find things but for me that's much less interesting than putting some actual biology and uh, either analytically if you can or to multi-scale model let some very complicated relationships emerge and uh, so so i don't want to think about uh, third order fourth order fifth order that's kind of counter, I mean, like Nigel would kill me <laughs> if I do that, so. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Uh, it's, it's a very, contra it's controversial because it depends on how you measure it. So the most typical, so some people, it's also there's this thing called, sp uh, depending on, uh, there's this thing called sp species area rule in ecology and maybe in soil you can generalize species volume rule. So if you count the number of species in a given area, you make the area twice as large, the number of species increases as the area to the power one quarter or something uh, uh, something like that. So it depends, uh, uh, but people have given numbers as high as 40,000 species in a teaspoon of soil. But then also there, uh, you have to keep in mind that the, uh, and if, you, uh, if, you, if you were careful, you saw that in my first slide I put species in quotes because there is no such thing as at least uh, there aren't that many microbiologists in the audience, but, so I can say it. Uh, I don't think this concept of species is uh, useful uh, in microbiology, or even if it's useful in practice, it's not fundamental. There's no way to, rigorous way to define different species. So for example, you can measure diversity just based on a single gene that's conserved uh, among all the bacteria. It's called the 16S gene. That's what people do most of the time. Uh, and then you, you get one diversity, but what I found in my experiments that even guys that have exactly the same 6NS, if you measure interactions, they will be different. That's because that's just one gene, and even if they're very, very closely related, so this gene is exactly the same down to the nucleotide, they will be different somewhere else in the genome, and pretty much every, these are like these fine-tuned ma uh, machines, and pretty much every mutation change what you do in the environment, right? It's, there is no such thing as a neutral mutation, so, uh, uh, that, that's, that was kind of the other thing. I mean, you need to jump straight to the eco-evolution because uh, if you do ecology, uh, if you do population genetics and stuff like that, you have to define what the population is. But what if every mutation basically creates its own population that does something different ecologically? So that's, there are these conceptual problems if you, uh, if you don't go all the way to you know, eco-evolution. So that's why I'm tr throwing away all these concepts and just, uh, working with more fundamental uh, notions. But yeah, it's, it's astronomical, yeah. For, yeah for, I mean, uh, uh, in the human gut, there will be thousands of species. And again, species doesn't mean anything because it might be, every single individual might be different, I don't know. So, so your model is like one or two antibiotics, right? So it could be already like 20,000. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, antibiotics is just one small way in which bugs can be different to each other. They eat different things, they, uh, they, uh, I, uh, one of them will be good at eating cellulose, others will be good at uh, or can only grow on glucose and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, I mean, it's a very biased talk because we talk so much about antibiotics, but there are all these 
<laughs> many, many, many other things that go on uh, in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, do you think this breaks down and you get into more complicated organisms, such as organisms that have gender? Uh, yeah, I mean, gender, uh, so, so, so it's uh, uh, what. I mean, yeah, I think so. Some of this, yeah, I, I, yeah. For example, yeah. I mean, you can imagine, for, for example, emergence of polymorphisms. Let's say in humans, there are four, five different blood types or something like that. So you, instead of only single one surviving, you have uh, uh, some kind of coexistence if it's stable. And and there are cases if that's not the case, it's stable. Uh, there are cases of stable polymorphisms where several traits coexist, and the rare traits, let's say, color of the eyes, maybe. Uh, the more rare a trait is, the more beautiful it is. So um, there is a frequency dependent selection. So you can ask if you have a, how do you go from, uh, in, the, in the case, if there are complex polymorphisms with many, let's say five different versions of the same thing, how do you go? Uh, then again, you have the same thing, right? The, the classical expectation is that the single variant in a given locus is going to win. Instead of that, you have diversity of different traits in a given uh, locus, and there's some ecological reason why there is uh, diversity uh, there. And then you can, I think all these things will apply again within a species. Uh, so yeah, it's, I think it will generalize, some of these things will generalize to sexual things, uh, to sexual uh, species. Some things will be different because here we don't have problem with speciation, like the big thing with uh, sexual species. You have, you ha there we have well-defined uh, populations Right, I mean, lions are different from <laughs> from wolves and so on. Uh, so, kind of this jumping around with the, you asked me the question about how the mutations move around. Yeah, this will be uh, somewhat. Uh, I mean, each uh, you can mix mutations within each species, but not between species, yeah. right? The genetic. Uh, so, so that that uh, that will be also different. But I think equivolution is just as interesting in uh, in. Uh, Let's say some of these ideas might apply to evolution of complexity. Let's say something as complex as I. You're saying, oh, these three different things need to happen simultaneously. How do they uh, happen? They cannot happen step by step, but maybe similarly to this tunneling events that we were seeing, maybe uh, you can, by some change of variables, you can map it to what's happening in, uh, with evolution of complexity where multiple beneficial mutations need to, to come together in the same organism at the same time for a trait to be uh, selected for. So I think yeah, uh, some of this will transfer. <laughs>